If you would stand to your feet just a moment, Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not to. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them. God said, I will be respected. You ain't going to disrespect me up in here. just want to let you know. I will be sanctified in them that come near to me. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. Couldn't say nothing to that. I want to go back to verse, verse 1 where it says, They put incense, and the sons of Aaron took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. I want to use a very strange subject this morning. I want to use a subject I'm authorized to do it. Yeah, it looks at myself. I'm authorized to do it. I, I need a little bit of help, Johnny, on this monitor up here. I'm authorized to do it. Father, bless your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Listen, this is a very interesting scripture. I, uh, I first encountered this scripture, Brother JP, as a young Christian. Um, I was a young student. I was excited about my newfound faith in Christ. I was 17 years old. I wasn't brought up. Uh, in a church-going family. We, went, we didn't go to church every Sunday and nothing like that. I, my family weren't church-goers, and so when I first encountered the scripture, uh, I had just became a Christian in my college, my freshman year in college, and I remembered at the time that the, the more seasoned saints, Mark Brown, were warning me, now, baby, don't offer up no strange fire before the Lord. See, we were young, a bunch of us. We were young. We were excited, right? We came in. We looked all crazy. You know, we wear different hair. and Our clothes were different. And, you know, because we weren't brought up in church, we hadn't been jaded yet. So we didn't have the church thing down. We didn't know when to stand and when to sit. And we didn't know how to give an honor to God and, and all to say. We didn't know none of that kind of stuff. We were just excited about the Lord. And so we brought this enthusiasm and this energy to the church that, that the church needed because there's nothing that gets your church fired up like new Christians. Yeah, it, 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 that, that's why I want new people in here. I, I, want, I want some some drug addicts. I want some prostitutes. I want some ex-felons. I want some people who had beleaguered, uh, badgered, broken lives. I want them in here because there's nothing like people who come from a bad past to give God a good praise. See, the saints, we didn't got too dignified. We didn't got too refined. We didn't got too cool with it. And we know all the church things to do. We know when to sit and when to stand and when to say and all that kind of stuff. But it's something about somebody staggering in here who just got out of jail that makes you think, I don't care what nobody think about me. But they warned us. They said, listen, 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 baby. All that jumping around excitement said, don't, don't bring no strange fire. That's what they called it, uh, Adrian. Don't bring no strange fire before the Lord. Uh, and the warning was mostly directed at the young people who were energetic and excited, but because they were different, they were radical. And a lot of times, listen, they were innovative, they were creative, they were progressive, they were non-traditional. And the seasoned saints were resistant to their energy because they limited the word strange here to mean weird or odd or unusual, peculiar or surprising. So the inference was that God, God was against anything that was new. That's what they implied. That we have a tradition. We have a decorum. We have a way of doing things. And so they would try to maneuver us into uh, behaving in a way that people had behaved for 50, 60, 100 years. And so they felt like their mission was to take away everything that made you unique about being new in this experience and to conform you to what they had already been steeped in for maybe 20 or 30 years. And the implication was that God himself was against anything that was new. 
anything that was progressive, anything that was contemporary, they infer that it was, if it was different, it was considered taboo or strange fire. And therefore, because it was strange, it was to be rejected at all cost. So if you came in here with this red hair, that's weird, that's strange, a strange fire. If you came in with all this energy and enthusiasm, and if you, if you put different riffs in your song and different uh, tempos in your music, that was considered strange fire, strange, that's weird. We don't do that over here. What we do over here, we sit quietly and we listen to the word of God, and you, 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 don't, you don't shout at the wrong times. Uh, if, if the preacher is given the call and response, it, it's undignified for you to say amen when he's shouting. And you, 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 can't, you, you can't be waving your hand too much. And I went to one of those churches where, where if you started running, the ushers would carry you out. I know that's nobody over here. Yeah. But, but that's they call it strange fire. You young people, sit down. Sit down. Strange fire up in here. You're jumping around too much. What's all this gyration and leaping and hollering and stuff? Sat down. A strange fire. But upon deeper study of the word strange, you will find that the actual word here means unauthorized. You see? It doesn't mean weird. It doesn't mean different. It just means you are unauthorized. Something that's unauthorized, if a person gains logical or physical access without permission, for example, to a network, to a system, to an application, Think of somebody trying to get into your computer or get into your laptop, and they would try to use some other way. If they're not an authorized user, they will pop up a screen and say, you are unauthorized. You don't have access. You don't have permission. When something is authorized, it means you do not have the proper, get this, you do not have the, op, the proper credentials to access this. I went to an event last week, and they had credentials that gave you access to different parts of the event. And if you did not have the proper credentials, you were not able to access different parts of the event. You might have some credentials, but there were certain credentials that you could not access unless you were given authorization. Uh, the badge that you wore gave you permission to access. In fact, sometimes, but well, this is what happened to me, Brother Mike, sometimes I didn't have access, but I was with somebody who had access. And, 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 see, and so because they had access, I was able to come in and get the same benefits because I was with somebody who has access. How many know that Jesus has access? If you really want to be telling the truth about it, none of us are worthy. None of us deserve it. None of us have the proper credentials to access the blessings that God has for us. That's, that's why I'm with Jesus. And through his name, I get to access things. I get to access favor and blessings and opportunity. That's why you ought to be excited about being in the beloved. That's why you ought to be excited about sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Because the truth be told, none of us are worthy. None of us deserve to be blessed or be healed or have God open up doors for us. But because I came in through Jesus, because I come in through Jesus, I now have access to the blessings and the favor of God. When something is unauthorized, it means you do not have the proper credentials. And James chapter 3 tells us this, that one of the reasons that he tells us that we don't get access to, we don't get things through prayer, is because we ask him amiss. That sometimes when we pray, we ask him amiss. You, you missed your target. You were trying to access something. You were trying to shoot something, as it were, a target, and you are off. You don't get it because you ask it amiss. You ask it so you can consume it with your own lust. What does that mean, Pastor? That quite honestly, some of you are not praying the will of God. You're not praying in alignment with God's will. You're praying amiss. You, you missed the mark. Some of you, you, quite honestly, instead of you praying God's will, you're trying to get God to get with your will. When Jesus said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that in reality, prayer doesn't change God. Prayer changes you. 
That when we pray, we're supposed to be moving our will and our desires into alignment with God's will. And some of you are not getting the answers to prayer because you're not praying God's will for your life. Let's be quite frank about it. Some of the things you're asking are not in God's will for you. And God loves you so much that even if you ask something that's outside of the will, sometimes he will withhold it. Because sometimes we ask for the wrong thing at the wrong time from the wrong source. And God, who is more concerned about your future than he is concerned about your comfort, will withhold things from you, shut down things for you. Anything, listen, anything that's going to harm you, hurt you, destroy you, or break you, God will rebuke that. God will shut that down. And sometimes you're praying for things that God is really trying to protect you from. We're praying to be connected to people that God is trying to release you from. We're praying for God to put us in situations that there are some doors that God closes for your protection, that God closes for your enlightenment, that God closes because he's caring about you and your concern. And I know it's like to be standing at a door and crying, God, open this door. I want this so bad, but God loves me too much to let me have my way. How many of you got kids? How many got kids that sometimes they want things that they're too young to realize it's going to hurt them later? And so you say no to them and they want to pout and they want to have a fit. But you as a parent understand that if I give this to you, it's going to kill you. It's going to destroy you because I am your father. I will shut things down. I will close doors. I will pull people out of your life. How many of you now can look back and thank God for people that left you, that broke your heart, that hurt your feelings, that destroyed? But but you look back later and think, Lord, I'm so glad. That's nobody in here. That's just me. I can, I can remember a few people that I cried when they walked away. But when I looked at it later, I said, Lord, I'm so glad because if you hadn't taken them out of the... Oh, Lord. If I'd have had what I wanted, I wouldn't have had this. You're not going to talk to me. If I'd have had who I wanted, I wouldn't have had this. If I'd have gone where I wanted, I wouldn't be enjoying this. Is there anybody that's glad for your this... Is there anybody can thank God? It may not have been what you wanted when you wanted, but I thank God for a this. I'm here. I'm a survivor. I'm blessed. I'm standing strong. I'm standing on my own two feet. God has favored me. If that's you, give God 30 seconds of your best praise. Is it possible? I'm just asking. I'm almost done. Is it possible that we're asking for something that is really not in God's will for you? So in our text, when it comes to worship, when it comes to worship, there is a way that God wants to be worshipped. There's an acceptable prescribed formula that God instructed them to use when it came to their worship. Right. You had to be an authorized person. You had to use authorized incense. And get this. You have to use authorized fire. And Adab and and, and Nadab and Abihu offered up unauthorized fire. Here was the issue. God had given them a formula for how he wanted to be worshipped. And there were two altars that were in the tabernacle that are very important for you. And I'm going to take the time and go back into a lesson on the tabernacle. But in the Old Testament, they had a tabernacle which represented the the presence of God. And in that tabernacle, God was teaching them through everything. They had several pieces of furniture. The two altars are the two things I want to talk about today. There was a certain way that God wanted to be worshipped. Two altars. Somebody say two altars. Two altars that were in that tabernacle. One was called the brazen altar. It was made out of brass. And this was an altar where they offered up sacrifices. This was an altar where they would bring their sacrifices, their goats, amen, their animals, and they would kill them and burn them completely on this altar. It was a bloody place. It was a terrible place. There's nothing cute about this altar. On this altar, what you saw was blood everywhere. Blood everywhere. What you heard were the sound of screaming animals as they were taken to the place of sacrifice and ripped apart until their entrails were hanging out, cut into pieces, laid on this altar. And the smoke of these burning flesh go up before the nostrils of God. It wasn't pretty. This went on all day long. All day long. And what God was trying to make them understand was the consequences of sin. That the wages of sin is death. 
And he wanted them to have, through an illustrated illustration, how dire, how deadly, how severe the consequences of sin was. And so imagine the priest standing there, blood dripping all down his hands and all down his robe. And, and all day long, all you heard was screaming animals being pulled to the altar and cut into pieces. This one, all the blood everywhere. It was blood all over the ground. It was blood all over the altar. It was blood all over the horns. It was blood. There was nothing pretty about it. But this is the price that they had to pay for sin. And God made individuals bring their sacrifices to the Lord because the truth be told that though there was an animal being laid on that bloody altar, it should have been you. That the truth be told that the animal that they used to offer up for sin was a substitute. And the dire and the death that that animal sacrificed, that death that they experienced should have been you and I. It was, should have been you for your trespasses, for your faults, for the things that you transgressed in. But because you were able to bring an animal to be a substitute, what that animal suffered should have been you. You should have been on that altar. You should have been killed. You should have been sacrificed. And so every time they brought an offering and to that brazen altar, it burned in their mind. It should have been me. But because I offered a substitute, I was spared from the death and the consequences of my sin because of a substitute. And so it is a perfect picture of Christ who became our substitute. That the truth be told, what happened to him on the cross should have happened to us. That he who was without sin became sin that you might become the righteousness of God. That the truth be told, you are not righteous. We are not good. We are not perfect. That we all should have suffered death. But because of Christ's sacrifice on the altar and on the cross, he became the substitute for us. For us. On that altar. And then there was another altar. It was called the altar of, of incense. And this altar was different. That, that was the brazen altar. That's where the blood and the suffering and the crying was. But then there was another altar. It was called the altar of incense. And on this altar, they didn't offer blood. They didn't offer sacrifice. There was no bleeding animals. There were no screaming sacrifices. On this altar, what they offered was incense. And incense was burned. And the smoke of that incense would go up before God as a sweet-smelling savor. These two altars, though important, they served a different purpose. One was where sin was dealt with. And the other typified the thanksgiving that we give because of the sin that was taken care of. Are y'all with me this morning? I I'm a little concerned this morning. As I look at the state of the church. Because there is no connection between the sacrifice on this altar and the incense that's offered on this one. The only thing these two places of sacrifices, the only thing that, the only thing that, that, that married the two was the fire that was used. They were instructed that the same fire that you would use to burn your sacrifice completely, it was supposed to take that fire and bring it over here. And then they would use the same fire to light their incense. Stay with me. I'm going to connect it in a minute. And so what, a, what, what the two priests did was instead of taking the fire from the first altar, and carrying it over to the second altar and letting it be lifted up before God. God said, you're not authorized to do that. I don't, I don't want you building another fire. I want you to take the same fire that you used to burn the sacrifice and use it to burn your incense. The same fire that's used to consume your sin offering, I want you to use it to offer up praise and worship and thanksgiving to me. 
My concern with the church today is we're not offering unto God authorized fire. We're not connecting the death of Jesus Christ to the praise that we give. We're not connecting what he did for us to what we offer to him. Let me make it plain for you. For the things that God has delivered you from. For the things that God has released you from. For the things that God has broken off of you. For the things that Jesus Christ's death has set you free from. There should be no reason why everything in this house shouldn't be shouting. There is no reason when you think, see, and this is part of the problem, Adrian. We don't preach the cross. We preach cars. We preach houses. We preach prosperity. We preach blessings. And so there's no connection, even in the church he died for, between his death and our praise. If you understood the depth of his sacrifice, it would make you understand the depth of your praise. When you think about what God has done for you, that alone should be enough to elicit a praise out of you. I shouldn't have to get you here by promising you a new car or a new job or a new boo. Without any of those things, I should be able to stand here on the strength of the death of Jesus Christ. And the whole place would have to erupt because when I think of what it should have been, when I knew I should have died, when I knew I should have been killed when I knew sin was the issue that separated me from God I don't need a new house I don't need a new car I don't need a new boo I don't need a new job I'm just glad to be saved if there anybody in here that's glad to be saved give God a shout right here and so here is the issue I'm almost done now here is the issue this is what the problem is with the church there's no connection between what God has done and what we present to him. For, for the level of sacrifice, for the level of things God did to set you free, your praise is not commiserate. It's not commiserate with what he's done. Let me make it plain to you. When you think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for you, your soul should cry out hallelujah. I shouldn't have to raise a shout in this house if you just look back at the things that God has brought you out of. Some of you confuse me. If he's only done a little for you, then sit there with a little praise. But for everybody that God has done something great for you, you should be shouting me down right now. You got your own testimony. You got the things that God has brought you out of. You got, is there anybody that God has delivered you from anything? Got you out of a bad situation? Brought you out of a bad marriage? Took you out of a bad relationship? Got you out of a bad job? Took the needle out your arm? Got you off of drugs? Pulled you out the jail? Took the taste of alcohol out your mouth? You should be the loudest person in here right now. Where you at? I'm in the wrong church. They're in the wrong church. God wanted there to be a connection between what he's done and how you react. And my problem with church is for all the things that God has done for you, your reaction is not equate to what he's done your response to what he's done is not commiserate for what he's oh my god the sacrifice from Christ's death should fuel your worship it should fuel your praise if we don't have no band no music 
no worship leader, if we don't have no drum, no cymbal, no organ, this place should be crazy with praise when I think about all that God has done for me. When you think about all the things that God has done for your children, the things that God has done for your house, the times that God has kept your mind, the time that God has kept you from going crazy, the times that God has opened a door for you. I want you to take 30 seconds and thank him for what he's already done. If he don't do nothing. Well, we're going to get there in a minute. I ain't hit you in the head yet. See, some of y'all, some of y'all were brought up in the wrong house. See, in my house, the first thing my mama taught me is when somebody does something for you, you say thank you. If somebody opens a door for you, what you say? Thank you. If somebody brings you a plate of food, you say what? Thank you. If somebody gives you a birthday gift or a birthday card or a gift, a Christmas gift, you don't walk off and don't say nothing. You turn around and say what? Thank you. But the problem with church folks, I don't know where you guys were raised at, is that when God does something for you, you sit there waiting for the next blessing and you haven't even thanked him for the last thing he's done. Is there anybody here that's thankful for what God has done? Take 30 seconds right here. I just want to take a moment right here and say thank you. Before I go on in my message, I just want to take a moment, 30 seconds right here and say thank you. You got your own testimony. You got the things that God has brought you through. He gave you a student loan. I say thank you. He kept me on this job. I say thank you. He gave me a new job. I say thank you. I got reasonable strength. I got reasonable health and strength. I say thank you. He kept these kids and I say thank you. Kept his old body going and I say thank you. Is there anybody in it that knows you owe God a praise? I'm going to step on some toes here. But I, I'm afraid that a lot of the stuff we're offering in church is unauthorized. It's not sanctioned. It's not anointed. It is not sanctioned by God. And the problem of the church is we lack discernment and we lack teaching. And because we lack discernment and we don't like to study, we don't know when something's real and when it's not. Everything that you call in God is not God. And everything you call the anointing is not the anointing. But because we don't know no better, we just mix it all in together and call it worship. And God said, I will not accept it. I will not be disrespected. I don't want that nonsense and I don't want that junk. It don't mean it got to be old school. It don't mean it got to be back to your grandmother's church. See, the method can change, but the message does not. When I begin to give God praise based on what he's done, that's what God receives sees you come in here dancing because you got a new boo god said i'm not trying to hear that you trying to build me a new fire based on what you uh determine to be worthy based on what you determine to be worthwhile and god says i will not accept it the person in here see see here's how it is mark you can tell when somebody is singing and has a real connection to the altar. There's a difference when somebody's singing and they have a relationship with the God that they're singing about. It's not that they're not a gifted or talented or have ability. That's not the question. But it's no anointing. There's no presence of God there. When somebody plays under the anointing, you can tell the difference. When somebody preaches and they have a real relationship with God, you can feel that. You can sense that. Because you can get up and say the right things and say the right words, but there's no power release. Because it's not just about saying the right thing and the right words. It's about having a relationship with the one who gave his life for you. Just because you're in church don't make you a Christian. And what we have... To in the church, we've raised a generation of people 
who do not appreciate what he's done. But somebody says, a pastor, I'm not a demonstrative person. This is not about emotion. It's about appreciation. I've seen people who will get in church and say, I'm not demonstrative, Brother Mark. I'm not demonstrative. I don't do all that. I don't emote all that. And I've seen these same people will go to a football game and lose their mind. I've seen people that are sit, men that are sit up in this church with their legs crossed. I don't do all that, Pastor. It don't require all that. We don't take all that. And I'll see them go to a football game, have a Super Bowl party at their house, and go bananas. I've seen people who will sit up in church and look like a mummy, but will go to a... I'm not kidding, like a mummy, like somebody just wrapped them up in tape, but will go to a concert and you can't hardly sit them down. Because, so here's what God is saying. I want the same energy. I want the same energy. The same energy that you put into chasing that woman. You know how you brothers are. If you get a woman on your mind, can't nobody stop you. Let me get off the men talk later. You ladies, you know how it is. You like that old Donna Ross song. Ain't no mountain high enough. Ain't no. Y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. Ain't no valley low enough. Ain't no river wide enough. When you get somebody in your mind, you know how to find them, call on them, texting them. You be chasing after them. You wake up thinking about them. You go to bed thinking about them. You text them and say, I was just thinking about you. I do just on my mind. I just wanted to say hi to you. I didn't want nothing. You're sitting up on the phone till you fall asleep talking about nothing. And God's saying, if you put the same kind of energy into chasing me that you put into chasing a person, if you put that kind of energy coming after me, if you put that kind of energy that you put into watching a football game, you had a football game. You ain't got no stock in that team. You don't know nobody on that team. When your favorite person go across the goalpost, you just jump up and down, throw chips in the air, run around, and you ain't getting no money from it. And yet God has died for you and set you free and broke demons off of you. And snatch needles at your arm. And you mean to tell me you ain't got no better praise for God than that? The devil is a lie. I want every praiser to jump up on your feet and identify yourself. The devil is a lie. There's no way in the world I'm going to give the devil more of my energy and my time than I'm going to give to my God. There's no way I'm going to shout for the text Tennessee Titan more than I shout for my God. There's no way I'm going to go to a Beyonce or a Janet Jackson concert and dance more than I... There's no way! That's about three people say, I'm going to give God my best. I'm going to give God my best. I'm going to give God my best. Listen, and I got to go real quick. When they began to burn the incense before the Lord, this is what would happen, minister. The smoke from the incense, which represent their prayer and their praise, would get mixed up in the smoke of God's presence. Yeah. And so while the incense was going up, it would intermingle with the presence of God until you couldn't tell where the incense began and the presence of God ended. You couldn't tell it was all mixed up in there together. And my concern with our church is that we're not creating an atmosphere where the presence of God can come in like a smoke. That the presence of God can come in and move the temple. When we begin to worship what happens is our praise and our prayers go up before God and God begins to be attracted. And God, what am I saying? I'm saying God is in the smoke. Look at somebody say, God's in the smoke. God's, God's in the smoke. When you see this worship team lifting up worship before God and singing, we're not trying to entertain you. We're trying to create a smoke. 
I'm trying to get you to come outside yourself. It'd be like the old song. Forget about yourself and concentrate on him. And when you begin to lift up praise before God and just begin to thank him for what he's done, God gets in the middle of your praise. And if you ever want God to come into your situation, I dare open your mouth right here and begin to give God praise and begin to open up and worship and begin to open. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh my God, oh, you're not going to do it because you're not because you're still stuck over at this altar, but you're trying to get something else, God, something else on this altar. But I want everybody to appreciate what God did for you to open up your mouth and give God praise until the presence of God comes in this place. Come on, come on, worship God until this place gets smoky. Worship God until you forget about the roast you got in the oven. Worship God until you forget how cute you are. Worship God until you forget where you came from and who you came with. Worship God until you forget about your title and your position. You're too important. You're too special. You're too grand. You're too great. But for everybody. God is in the smoke. God is in the smoke. God is in the midst of her. God is in the God is in the midst of our praises. I can't only get off it. God's been bothering me about it all week long. He just has been praying about our church and God and Faison said, God said, Faison, listen. My people don't praise me at the level of what I've done for them. It's strange. It's strange. It's like the UPS people when they send something to your house and you got to sign for it. Certified mail to prove that you got it. And we wonder why people don't want to come to our church. We wonder why people don't want to come and serve your God. When you're not even happy about your God. He don't excite you. Why should he excite me? You don't halfway want to praise him. Why would I be attracted to that? You act like, and you're supposed to be the people of God. And you act like he's done nothing for you. He ain't done no more than that. He ain't been no better to you than that. For the times he protected you and kept you and anointed you with your crazy self. With your issues and with your problems and with your weaknesses, God blessed you anyway. And you ain't got no better praise than that. I'm going to tell you three things I want to get out of your way. I want to talk to you about the sacrifice of yourself. Is it possible that you're offering God something that he's not asking for? That he offering God something that he doesn't even want. The most difficult thing for you to sacrifice is yourself and your will. That's the most difficult thing to sacrifice. To give up what you want for what he wants. To give up your way. Some of you will give up money before you give up yourself. You'll give up anything making a deal with God. But in this season, God said to tell you there will be no substitutes. In this season, what I want is you. There'll be no deals cut. There'll be no, I'll go later. There'll be no, oh, I'll send my wife to represent our house. No, God says, I want you. Oh, yeah, that hit, didn't it? Is it possible that some of you are offering God things that he doesn't even want? I don't want your voice. I want you. I don't want your talent. I want you. I sat down with this band and I had a meeting with them and I said, above everything, I want you. It's not your ability to play. My first assignment is to you as a soul. We'll enjoy your gift, but I want you. 
Because in this season, God is saying, sacrifice of yourself. The Bible says, present yourself a living sacrifice. Holy, completely, and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Well, I came to church today. That's reasonable. That's expected. You act like you're doing God a favor. Well, at least I came to church today. Y'all do too much. Was it too much for Jesus to give his life? Y'all do too much. It don't require all that. Did it require Jesus to be beat like a dog and crucified? He who was without sin, who became sin, was it too much for them to put the crown on his head or to pierce him in his side? Was it too much for them to mock him and snatch his beard out of his face? Now, he went through all that and he didn't think that was too much for you, but you think it's too much Number two, I want to talk about the sacrifice of praise. Because in this season, we can't offer up nothing to God, no complaints. No complaints. Most of us, our prayer time is spent complaining about things. What's wrong with people? What's wrong with the church? What's wrong with my spouse? What's wrong with my life? Our whole prayer session becomes a complaint opportunity. When the Bible says very clearly, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. That the whole point of us coming to God's presence should be to offer unto him something that he is pleased with. So how do we know that sometimes praise is a sacrifice? It's not that we feel like it. It's not that I want to. It's not that things are always going the way that I intended to. It is not where God says, how are you feeling today? You feel like praising me? You feel like giving me glory? When you walk in the door, you should walk in the door with the intention, I will praise him. I will. I will. It's not about how did I sleep last night? How'd you work? How you feeling this morning? Are you hungry? Is your toe feeling good? There should be something in your mind that says, if I woke up, if my eyes popped open, I will praise him. If I got breath in this body, I will praise him. And if I come all the way out here to church, I could have sat home and been a mummy. But if I'm going to come all the way out here, I'm going to at least get my praise in, not because I feel good, but because he's worthy. I didn't get a new check. I didn't get a new car. I didn't get a new house. I'm praising God because he's worthy. And you got to praise him whether you feel like it or not. And if you wonder why your blessings are inconsistent, is it because maybe your praise is inconsistent? But I want somebody who will be like David and says, I will bless the Lord at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. If that's you, give God a shout right here. Last thing and I'm done. Last thing I'm done. I talk about the sacrifice of self and the sacrifice of praise. I want to talk about the sacrifice of service. In this season, God said, there'll be no excuses. In this season, there'll be no excuses. We are not saved to sit. We are saved to serve. That God didn't save you because he needed to have these chairs filled. That God saved you because he had a world to be saved. Love is an action word. We demonstrate our love for him through our, get this, our service. That God does not anoint your position. He does not anoint your position. He anoints your function. What are you here to do? What has God saved you from the world to do? Here's what's what's interesting about people. We see the stage, we see the pulpit as a stage, as a platform, as some place to be seen, some place to be noticed. But it's an altar. It's a place to be sacrificed. And quite honestly, we make it more about us than it is about him. 
is about us. If we're not preaching about us, what we have, what we wear, what we drive, if we're not bragging about how many houses we have and what thread counts we have, we're not interested. When we talked about Jesus, we looked dry as toast. We did. We just looked like, who are you talking about? Who? But if I started preaching to you about million-dollar houses and million-dollar cars and Bentleys and all that, we'd go to shouting. And then we wonder why we don't have the presence of God in our churches and in our lives. Because there's no connection between what he's done and what he offered. So at the risk and at the behest of resisting the temptation to shout, I want to challenge you with what God challenged me today. I wonder if there are people in here, first of all, who have a real relationship with God. A real relationship with God. Not with the church. So I'm not asking you, is your name on the church roll? I'm not asking you, are you a member of the Impact Church? I'm not asking you if your grandmother put down the first pew in the church. I'm not asking you how far back your history goes. My mother was a Sunday school teacher. My grand- I'm, asking you, I'm asking you, do you have a relationship with God? I'm not asking you if you need a million dollars. I'm not asking you if you need healing. Those things are byproducts of relationships. If you get Jesus, you can get the money. If you get Jesus, you can get the healing. If you get Jesus, you get the opportunity. So on this Sunday in this church, I want to challenge you to find out if you know Jesus. In the free pardon of your sin. I want to check your relationship with God this morning. I want to check where you are in your relationship with him. I don't want to assume that because you got a promotion on your job that that means that you and Jesus are all right. I don't want to assume that. I don't want to assume that. I don't want to assume that because you have deacon or minister or elder in front of your name that you know God. I don't want to assume that. I don't want to assume that because you're an usher or a praiser or in the culinary ministry, or a deacon, that you have a real relationship with God. And I tell you why I'm challenged with it. Because in reality, something in you right now should be kicking. I resisted the temptation, Adrian, to go like I normally go into and go into a fit. I'm standing here on purpose, not going into a fit. Because this is not about emotion. Y'all know me, I'll kick my shoes off. I'll run down the aisle. I'll do a cartwheel. I'm demonstrative. That's how I am, Connie. But God said, cut all that demonstration and get them back to an altar. Get them back to a place where they sacrifice their self, sacrifice their praise, sacrifice their service. And if they're not sacrificing like that, I'm not receiving this praise. They're leaping, but I ain't in it. They're jumping, but I ain't in it. Because you're jumping off of something that has nothing to do with your relationship with God. And so in this moment right here, what I saw in my spirit was a room full of praisers. What I saw in my spirit is a room full of worshipers. And God began to deal with me about turning a corner in this church. Turning a corner. What I mean by turning a corner is we're moving away from being spectators. We're moving away from waiting to see what happens. We're moving away from coming to church to see what's going to happen next. But we're moving into being people who create an atmosphere where God is glorified. We create it. The Bible says this, that God God inhabits the praises of his people. 
That when we begin to lift up praise before God and worship before God, it means he's literally enthroned. He comes and he sits in the middle of our worship. You think that we made the investment in the band so that we could have the presence of God. But the truth be told, you should already have the presence of God. And the band just helps us create a harp and bowl relationship that's talked about in the book of Revelations where they were playing with the harps and then the altar went up with sweet smelling sentence. So I'm going to challenge you in this moment. How many praises I got in here? Where are my real worshipers at? Stand up on your feet. Stand up on your feet. Identify yourself. I I'm going to do something that's going to challenge you. It might take us a few weeks to get us there, but I'm going to stay right here until we get it. What I want to see in this room are real worshipers. People who have a real relationship with God and, 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 and you're willing to open up your heart and praise him and worship him not based on anything other than his presence in your life. I don't want you singing another song. I don't want you playing another instrument. I don't want you ushering at the door. I don't want you to get another position in this church until you become a worshiper. I want the worshipers, all the worshipers to take over this atmosphere. Every worshiper take over this atmosphere. Daphne was worshiping earlier and she was talking about, I'm trying not to be out of order. You are absolutely in order. Worship and praise is the order of the day. I'm going to try to hold my mule because I'm trying to jump into it too. But God sent me on an assignment to find me some real worshipers. There is no connection between your altar of sacrifice and your altar of incense. You ain't giving me no real worship. You ain't giving me the kind of praise that is burning on the altar of your heart. No wonder your praise is ineffective. No wonder your prayers are ineffective. You're not burning it. If it don't mean nothing to you, it don't mean nothing to me. Take it right here. 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 I want to move this church into a place that when we do altar, we do praise and worship. I want to see you rushing the altar. I don't want to see you sitting back there when the praise team gets up here and begin to praise and worship. I want you to have permission to move your way up to this altar and begin to worship around this altar because this is what we were called to do. Praise is what we do. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're so used to worshiping God with all these props and all these special entertainment and all this special stuff that when it's time for us to just do it raw and naked and bare before God, we don't know how to do it. We got to have permission to come to the altar. We got to have permission to bow. We got to have permission to get up. We got to have permission to cry. And I'm breaking all those rules today. I'm telling you I'm on assignment from God. I don't want to be another Sunday where we sit out there and worship. You need to be up here and worship if you're a real worshiper you need to be at this altar right now because this is my this is my position i'm assuming the position i'm assuming the position i'm in his presence i'm in his face i am here this is where i ought to be i'm offering up right now Come on, worshipers, take over this building. God said, I will be respected. I will be respected. The unbelievers won't respect me because you don't respect me. They ought to see you worshiping me. They ought to see you bowing before me. Hallelujah. Come on, worshipers, take over this room. If you're not a worshiper, get off the instrument. If you're not a worshiper, take off your title. If you're not a worshiper, get off of the crowd. Get off of the team because I want worshipers. 
Walk this room if you have to. Mark your territory if you have to. Bow on your face before God if you have to. Move somebody out the way if you have to. I'm releasing anger and I'm releasing frustration because I was called to worship him. Oh, I know it's strange and I know it's weird and I know it feels uncomfortable because you don't do it on a regular basis. But this is where God wants you to be. I'm authorized to do this. I'm authorized to do this. You ain't been getting a breakthrough because you're using the wrong code. You're supposed to be a worshiper. You're supposed to be praising God. If you put the right code in, you can get access to God. If you put the right code in, you can get a breakthrough. If you put the right code in, the peace of God will overshadow you. If you put the right code in, you'll have the glory of God. God! Shake this place. Turn this place upside down. Hallelujah. Come on in, Jesus. Come on in, Jesus. You don't need our talent. You don't need our skills. You don't need our ability. You're God all by yourself. Let your presence be in this place. You don't need my preaching. You don't need our playing. You don't need our singing. You are the Lord of this church. Come on in, Holy Spirit, and sit on every one of these worshipers. In the name of Jesus. Fill this place with smoke. 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 Come on, let this place get smoky with the glory of God. Let it take over every area of your life. I'm letting go of anger today. I'm letting go of unforgiveness today. I'm letting go of frustration today. I'm letting go of sin today. I'm letting go of my past today. I'm not making no excuses today. If you're a worshiper, this should be easy for you. I shouldn't have to pull you into this. Has God done anything in your life? Push your way into it. Push your way into it. It feels uncomfortable. Push past your flesh. Push past your title. Push past whoever you think you are. And touch the heart of God. I need a touch from the Lord. I don't need no preacher. I don't need no singer. I don't need a worship leader. My worship is down on the inside. I need you. I want every usher worshiping God. I want every deacon worshiping God. I want every minister worshiping God. I want every musician worshiping God. I want every guest worshiping God. I want every visitor worshiping God. God! This ain't about you. This is about him. This ain't about your name. This ain't about your title. This is about him. This ain't about what you came to get and what you came to find. This is about him. If you got to walk the floor, walk the floor. If you got to fall on your knees, fall on your knees. If you got to cry, look, this whole altar is full. I got plenty of room on this altar. You got to assume the position. This is the place. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. There's a shift in the atmosphere. There's a shift in the atmosphere. Something's changing in the atmosphere. God wants to do something new in this place. God's taking us to another place. God is moving us in this place. Good God Almighty. I'm going to keep chipping away at it until we change the culture. I'm going to keep chipping away at it until when we have worship time in this church. I want you rushing up to this altar. Don't rush to your seat. Come right up here because this is the place where God wants you to be. You see where you are right now? This is where God wants you to be at the beginning of the service, not at the end of the service. He wants you up here worshiping him before the first song goes up. You need to be up here worshiping God. Where are my worshipers at? Hallelujah, 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 
Hallelujah. My, my musicians are worshiping God. My ushers are worshiping God. My deacons are worshiping God. My ministers are worshiping God. Hallelujah. My children's worshipers are worshiping God. Oh my God. Husbands are worshiping God. The men are on their faces before God. Hallelujah. The women are on their faces before God. The children have got their hands up before God. This is what God wants. Access granted. Access granted. Access granted. You can get whatever you want in this atmosphere. Come into his presence with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful. Of you can reach up and get whatever you want in this atmosphere. Good God Almighty is coming to you right now. God is downloading it to you right now. Come on. Chase after him. 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 Chase after him like you chase after that man. Chase after him like you chase after that woman. Chase after him like you chase after that job. Like you chase after an opportunity. This ain't no audition. This is worship. My house shall be called a house of prayer. My house shall be called a house of worship. When people come into this place, they're going to know that this is a house of worship. This is not an entertainment hall. This is not an auditorium. This is a house of worship. And the Lord shall be glorified in this house. Come on, JP. Y'all come on and give me something in here. Come on. The Lord shall be glorified in this house. He shall pat nana sha. He korova shada. He koro shabaha. Forgive me, Lord, for not praising you like you deserve to be. Forgive me for not giving you glory like you deserve it. Forgive me, Lord, for being so full of myself and being stuck up and being proud and not giving you worship for real, for real. Forgive me for putting my denomination before you. Forgive me, Lord, for putting my ambition before you. Forgive me for putting, making money before you. God, I lay it down. He's here. He's here. He's here. That's what the dancers said. He's here. The presence of the Lord is here. That's why Daphne couldn't hardly come out of it. Because he's here. He's here. Yeah. Yeah. My finance team is praising God. My altar workers are praising God. He tub of Hallelujah. 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 The fire of the altar was designed that it would burn continuously. It's supposed to be on all the time. I'm supposed to be in this posture all the time. I will bless the Lord at all times. Lift your voice and let it be heard. Lift your voice and let it be heard. Open your mouth and let it be heard. Out of the depths of your heart, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Come on. If you got something down in you somewhere, open your mouth and let that water out right now. In the name of Jesus, the Holy Ghost is laying hands on you. The Spirit of God is laying hands on you right now. It's coming out of your belly. The worshipers are taking over the room. Yeah, if you're wondering what's happening, the worshipers are taking over the room. The presence of the Lord is here. I can feel him in the atmosphere. He shall buy. Somebody forgot where they were. Somebody forgot what they was worried about. Because the presence of the Lord is here. Hallelujah.